Right, well, I'm just checking you can hear me. Yeah, you're nearly quiet, don't you? Um, I think it's almost, uh, almost too easy uh, to identify the principal, uh, most important legacy uh, of the Enlightenment. Um, and why is it easy? I think because Immanuel Kant appeared to tell us exactly what this legacy was in that era defining essay uh, in, in 17, 1784, What is Enlightenment? His answer, uh, the freedom to make use of one's public reason in all matters. The freedom, that is, to use one's reason to criticise and challenge, say, religious doctrine, uh, government legislation, and so on. Uh, the freedom to use one's, reason, one's own reason to pursue the truth. The, the freedom to use one's own reason to decide and to determine for oneself what is good, even to determine what one ought to do. Enlightenment was not a thing for Kant. Uh, you can't say that there is enlightenment. You can't really identify it as something existing. Um, for Kant, it was and is, I think, a process. It is a process born of people exercising their freedom to reason for themselves, uh, of people practically, and for Kant, freedom is the exercise of practical reason, of people practically demonstrating their freedom, acting according to their reason, not their inclinations or desires. Enlightenment is the freedom, therefore, to decide for ourselves what we think and how we ought to act. Now, actually, as Frank said earlier, he used this very well, you know, Kant's not naive. Uh, he talks of man's needs and passions and inclinations conflicting with and mixing with our reason. Uh, he writes, well, Kant writes famously that from this crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight has ever been made. In Kant's eyes, we are very far from perfect. Uh, so he doesn't think that enlightenment is an inevitable process, uh, that all is for the best and best of all possible worlds, as Voltaire's Pangloss would have it. Uh, no, enlightenment depends, as far as Kant sees, on the one hand, uh, on the existence of rulers who permit this free exercise of reason. Uh, so you see in the What is Enlightenment essay, Kant praising the then uh, King of Prussia, Frederick II, for his relative tolerance. And on the other, it, it, goes, it goes beyond rulers, uh, it also depends on people's own courage and willingness to use their own reason. Their willingness to think for themselves, uh, rather than be told what to think, or indeed what to do. Uh, or as Kant has it, this fear of freedom is apparent in our reliance in experts. Uh, in, reliance on experts in public life, uh, you know, like asking a physician to prescribe a diet or a pastor to be our conscience. Um, enlightenment requires us to dare to know, as Kant famously put it, to have the courage to use our own understanding. Now, I do think this belief in the power of reason, if you like, this, uh, this belief, therefore, in our ability as rational beings to think freely and freely to determine our existences, to act according to laws of which we are the authors, to be self-legislating subjects, is the key legacy of the Enlightenment. And I think it's why the Enlightenment has a universalist impulse as well. Uh, this, as Frank was saying earlier, is not the same as saying we're all the same. Uh, it is saying that we all potentially have the capacity to reason for ourselves. That through the exercise of reason, we cease to be what we were and aspire to partake in something approaching the universal. Providing we're given the opportunity, that is, providing we're given the liberty to practice our reason. Um, and even then, even if we are given the liberty to practice our reason, this doesn't mean that we will uh, realise ourselves as rational beings, that we will behave or act according to our reason, or that even if we do, we won't make mistakes. But we'll learn, says Kant, as a child learns to walk. Remember, enlightenment, as Kant sees it, is a process. Uh, it's a developmental process, an accomplishment, and it's something that all are capable of accomplishing. But in some ways, Kant always makes it too easy for us. Uh, he gives us the definition uh, of the Enlightenment. He, you know, enlightenment is man's release from his self-incurred tutelage. He gives us the motto, uh, dare to know. He gives us, in effect, uh, the Enlightenment as an advert. He gives us almost like the movie trailer uh, for the Enlightenment. And for a good reason, I think. He's writing in 1784, and he's writing it in the Prussian town of uh, Konigsberg, which is now a town called Kaliningrad, in, in, the, in a Russian enclave just west of Lithuania. In other words, he was writing it towards the end of the Enlightenment and far from its largely urban mainstream. And this spatial and temporal distance, I think, uh, provides him with a special vantage point. Um, it allows him to survey the landscape of the Enlightenment as a whole, to distill, if you like, and abstract from over a century's worth of intellectual achievement 
and almost boil it down to its best bits. And I think in doing so, in seeing the Enlightenment almost purely in terms of that essay of Kant, we miss something of the Enlightenment's explosive sort of developmental glory of how it drew deep on and surpassed its two main precursors, the Renaissance and the Reformation. And what is missed, I think, if we take Kant at his word, is just how enlightening the Enlightenment was in Kant's sense. We miss how reason didn't just flourish of its own accord. It was tried and tested, trialed and errored. From Kant's grand vista, we kind of miss the dialectics of reason, uh, of reason's growth. We miss the growing confidence with which individuals were exercising their reason, not only against the still excellent authorities of state and church, but also against each other. There was no Enlightenment collective. Uh, there was no party line to be towed by the Enlightenment party. The Enlightenment was not really a consensus. Uh, it was a contest, a multifaceted conflict between many individuals employing their reason, uh, often, trying to do out, uh, often trying to outdo each other. And this, I think, is important to grasp. It was a contest. It was a contest mediated by the emerging institutions of an increasingly literate public sphere. Uh, the books and journals, the salons, the cafes, the societies, indeed the corresponding societies, you know, letter writing, you know, they were always writing letters to one another. It was a massively important aspect of, of the Enlightenment. And of course, the Enlightenment was informed to some extent by a rising, increasingly confident, perhaps even a somewhat revolutionary social class, uh, the bourgeoisie. So I think what you can see in the historical Enlightenment is, following on from Frank's lecture this morning, what you can see is the growing authority of a burgeoning public sphere, an authority derived not from the church and not even from antiquity, as perhaps was the case uh, uh, for the Renaissance humanists. No, the authority that was, uh, that was present and uh, being used in this emergent public sphere, uh, the space in which some people were increasingly free to use their reason on all matters, as Kant would have it, was derived from nothing less than the free exercise of human reason itself, on who was making the best arguments, on who was making, sorry, on who was coming closest to the truth. So while it's not easy to date the historical enlightenment, you know, some say it begins perhaps with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, others with the uh, scientific revolution, others limited to the 18th century and so on, there is no doubt I think, that it marks a distinct cultural and intellectual era. And Kant's right to focus on the increasing confidence, I think, in the power of human reason as its defining characteristic. That is from the likes of Francis Bacon in the early 17th century to the French encyclopedists uh, 100 years later. There was a growing belief that through the power of, re of human reason, we can understand why nature and increasingly society exists as it does and harness that understanding for the betterment of humanity. In a strong sense, Enlightenment thought takes nothing for granted. Uh, nothing is simply as God or anyone intended it. Uh, through its various protagonists, reason is constantly challenging reality to justify itself. Uh, the natural sciences are challenging nature to reveal why the physical world is as it is, uh, trying to grasp the general laws to um, manifest in a, in a particular phenomenon. And society itself, its legal forms, its governmental forms is subject to the same challenge. Um, people are asking why do they exist as they do? And in light of such knowledge, in light of such knowledge generated by that questioning, um, the, uh, and in light of such knowledge, in light effectively of these various things, almost denaturalizing social forms, another question is emerging. Ought society to exist as it does? The Enlightenment, you see, was a profoundly historicizing moment. Um, you can see that people are sensing that, that there are forces of change, not just in nature, but in, but in and behind and through societal forms. And as the Enlightenment folds, what you see then is the empowerment of human reason. Um, Ernst Cassirer, in, 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 in actually what I find a rather dull book, uh, The Philosophy of the Enlightenment from the 1930s, calls Enlightenment reason a kind of energy, a force comprehensible only in its agency and effect. And you can see that, you can see how the use of reason is shaping and revolutionising all fields of human endeavour. It's there in the scientific revolution of the mid-17th and early 18th century, where its principal protagonists, Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, and perhaps to a lesser extent John Locke, pioneered the empirical method, as it's so-called, uh, which is caricatured, I think largely, 
as a method uh, that says that all understanding is derived through the senses. It was probably more complicated than that. Um, in short, Bacon, Francis Bacon, uh, didn't just didn't just expose himself, if you like, to sensory data and seek to find a theory to explain that data. Uh, rather, he grounded his new science on the observation of facts from which a theory can be induced, sorry, adduced by inference. Either way, though, I think what's important is that the natural world has been subjected to a rigorous to a rigorous questioning and testing in the attempt to find the natural laws that determine the appearance of natural phenomena. And in doing so, of course, Bacon, for example, is challenging the authority of those, uh, of those in religious positions uh, who stick fast, perhaps still, to the idea of uh, the book of nature, that nature is to be read, uh, if you like, as God's revelation. Uh, Bacon is constantly talking of battling those uh, possessed of, as he puts it, blind and moderate religious zeal, which he described as a troublesome an intractable enemy to science. Here I think it's worth a quick digression. Uh, it's worth pointing out, I think, that the Enlightenment was not anti-religious, not in any straightforward way. Uh, and not just because many of its leading protagonists were, you know, kind of pretty devout Christians who put God at the centre of their intellectual projects. Uh, what many of them opposed was not religion, but ecclesiastical authority. Uh, be it Bacon or Locke or Voltaire, their problem was with being told what to believe. Uh, not belief itself, uh, being told what we can and can't, being told what we can and can't know, that's what they objected to. And it's obvious why, because it was a front to the power of human reason, it was a front to reason, it was a front to freedom, and a front that is to one's freedom to believe what one in good conscience believes. Uh, as Rousseau put it uh, in a letter to Voltaire in 1754, I'm outraged as, as you are that the faith of everyone is not in the most perfect liberty and that man dares control the interior of consciences where he ought not to penetrate. They didn't promote, um, they didn't promote the idea of atheism, they promoted, of course, the idea of tolerance. But returning to our theme, uh, the enlightenment is both empowerment and authorization of human reason, um, religion is affected. Uh, the founding texts of religion were increasingly subject to the power of reason. Uh, why, for instance, is the Bible, why does the Bible exist as it does? Uh, it's no longer enough to say that it embodies the word of God. Uh, people were aware that there were different versions, there were corrupted versions, uh, there were dodgy uh, translations, and they were also aware of non-Christian influences on the Bible. Um, and this, this transformation, this willingness to uh, question this you know, sacred text, um, meant that, uh, for instance, the 17th century Dutch philosopher, uh, Spinoza, was uh, scandalously prepared to see the Bible as a sacred history rather than the word of God. It was a moral doctrine just for a particular people. It wasn't a moral command from him upstairs. Or elsewhere, the use of reason, the refusal to take anything as it appears, also transforms the study of history itself. Uh, thinkers really started uh, trying to get to grips with causality in history, why some societies are so radically different to ours, and so on. Um, as Svetan uh, as, as, uh, Svet Todorov, I'm worried about pronouncing that name, um, as he put it uh, in a recent, actually a recent book, I think called In Defense of Enlightenment, uh, the age of enlightenment was characterized by the discovery of the foreignness of others, whether they lived in an earlier time or somewhere else. They were no longer seen as an embodiment of our ideal or a distant foreigner of our current perfection. In other words, that people lived and lived differently with different forms of government, different social, ritual, uh, different social rituals, different mythologies and much of anything else, was no longer just a mere fact or something to be arbitrarily collapsed into a narrative justifying our society as it is today. Rather, historical distinctions were to be, uh, were to be explained, they were to be analysed. Uh, people attempted to say why uh, societies were different in the past. And you can see this attempt to explain the foreignness of others, past and present, in the Italian uh, Vico, in the, in the work of the Italian Vico, uh, you can see it in the work of uh, the, uh, the German philosopher uh, and largely actually sort of historian, uh, uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, uh, who actually proves to be a tremendous influence later on on Hegel, and you can see it of course in the work of, uh, of Edward Gibbon. And of course economic life as well, or better still the forms of economic life, from money to the price of land, were increasingly subject to the power of reason, increasingly subject to interrogation. So in 1720, the failure of the French government's plans to refinance the public debt uh, appeared not as a piece of ill fortune, you know, something like, just, like bad weather, but as a challenge to be understood and overcome. 
So the physiocrats emerged, they respond, they argue that agriculture is a source of, source of value and therefore agricultural produce should be highly priced. But their understanding uh, was weak and was criticised and superseded by the leading figures of the Scottish Enlightenment, David Hume and later still Adam Ferguson and of course most notably uh, Adam Smith. So you, so you see, throughout, throughout the Enlightenment, uh, there was this growing confidence, I think, in humanity's ability to grasp why things are as they are, to reconstruct conceptually the causality in nature, in history, in economics, and then to use it to affect matters, to harness such understanding for human ends. You know, this was the power of reason. And I think that's one of the most spectacular manifestations of this confidence in the authority of and the power of human reason is probably, is probably the work of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In the mid-18th century, he holds the state of society itself to account, not in ecclesiastical or civil courts, but in the court of human reason. He's asking why we as humans live together in increasingly complex societies. Uh, why do we live under the forms of government and social organisation that we do? Um, you, can of source, you can, of course, see a similar form of questioning in John Locke's second treatise, on government, where in his attempt to justify the so-called glorious revolution of 1688, he develops, following Hobbes, the notion of the social contract as the founding act of society, uh, saying, for this arrangement to be legitimate, we must consent to it. We must consent to giving up and pooling our natural freedoms in the interests of collective self-preservation. But I think it's only really over half a century later in the work of Rousseau that the state of society is subject to some of the most, impro one of the, some of the most probing, stinging, historicizing criticism. Uh, like Locke and Hobbes, Rousseau recognises the social contract as the founding act, that legitimacy rests on consent, law and accepted convention and so on. But he wants to know why. He wants to know why we consent to this state of society, this social state. Uh, so in his discourse on the origin of inequality written in 1754, he wants to know why there is such inequality, why there are some who are so rich and some who are so poor, and whether this state can actually be justified justified, whether it can be justified by a law of nature. And what follows in, in, in this discourse on the origin of inequality, what follows is a logical, philosophical prehistory of the state of society, namely a logical, philosophical construction of the state of nature and its transformation into the state of society. And what's explosive about Rousseau's portrait of this transformation of the state of nature and the state of society it's first how he, how he historicizes the human self itself, how our instinct for self-preservation is transformed through our socialization, uh, through its historical socialization, into something like self-liking, as he puts it, the process, that is, where we see ourselves in the eyes of others. We become vain, we become greedy, glory-seeking, even unfaithful. And second, of course, what's most explosive about uh, Rousseau is how he presents the history of society as the history of like, a grand corruption, the corruption of our natural state of freedom, um, a, a fettering of our natural freedom, a fettering of our capacities and, and, and abilities. Um, as he puts it, of course, in the opening of the social contract, um, man is born free, but of course, everywhere he is in chains. And interestingly, and interestingly such is the rational challenge that Rousseau is posing to society, asking it to justify itself, and such is his historicizing method, breaking up social reality into its composite parts, government, laws, family, and so on, that he also starts to undertake a critique of private property as a source not only of inequality, in which property owners uh, command those without and labor for them, he also identifies it as the source of the perpetuation of inequality, indeed the perpetuation, if you like, of man's alienation from his own natural liberty. Now, the social contract published in 1762 offers a corrective, I think, to the scathing critique of the societal existence that he, that he uh, conveys in the discourse on the origins of inequality. And you can see this where Rousseau writes uh, that in the state of society, man's faculties are exercised and developed. His ideas are broadened, his feelings are nobled, his entire soul is elevated to such a height that if the abuse of this new condition did not often lower his status to beneath the level he left, he ought constantly to bless the happy moment that pulled him away from him forever, and which transformed him from a stupid, limited animal into an intelligent being and a man. But the critique of the prior discourse uh, on equality is still there, hence the caveat in that passage, 
uh, if the abuser's new condition did not often lower his status to beneath the level he left. In fact, the social contract is an attempt to envisage a state of society in which man rediscovers his lost natural freedom, outlined in the second discourse, in a higher form, uh, a state in which the individual will is identical, uh, identified uh, with the general will, the source of lawmaking and sovereignty. A society, that is, in which, it, in which the individual gains the civil state of moral liberty and which alone makes, him, which alone makes man truly master of himself. Now, Rousseau, of course, is not just, using reason, not just using reason to freely question and challenge the state of society in the name of freedom. He's arguing, of course, with other propagators of enlightenment. So he's engaged with Hugo Grotius, uh, John Locke, and contemporaries, of course, like Voltaire and David Hume, um, who I think he had a, a particularly difficult relationship with. Uh, likewise, all the figures we've so far mentioned uh, are engaged not just in grasping why things are as they are, using their reason in the attempt to discover the laws of physical, historical and social development. They're also doing so in a debate and conflict with their peers, uh, the classical political economists, the critical, the critical of the physiocrats, and so on. And here, I want to return back to where we started. I want to go back to Kant again. Because what is really interesting about Kant's, what is enlightenment essay, the work that effectively bookends the Enlightenment that stands over it, or if you like, is its summation, um, is that Kant himself has just undertaken a critique of many strands of the Enlightenment. A critique of those who have misunderstood uh, the power of reason. The critique, of course, of pure reason. Uh, so, of course, I'm now just going to talk about the critique of pure reason for that for a moment. Um, <laughs> now, it's impossible to do that work justice, which is as that weak joke, but in re but in really broad outline, Kant criticises the idea that knowledge of the world comes through our sensory experience of it. Kant, uh, Kant counters that this is naive. He argues that my experience, or one's experience of the world, is in fact already informed by a pre-existing interpretation of the world. Uh, we don't simply experience space, time, and causality, for instance, just by, just by experiencing it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, they are concepts with which we interpret experience prior to experience. They don't come to us from our immediate sensory experience. <coughs> or better still, I think, as Goethe uh, put it, all fact is already theory. Now, Kant will go on to explore the a priori categories of reason, uh, the categories, that is, with which we, as rational beings, uh, determine the sensible world, the way that is the world appears to us. And of course he will go on to say in an argument that seems almost scandalous in the context of the Enlightenment, that we cannot have access to things as they are in themselves. So Kant imposes a limit on reason. In other words, our knowledge of the world, he says, produced by reason, will always be limited by this thing in itself. Why? Because we know things, why? Because to know things as they are in themselves would require us to have made them, to have generated them, uh, much as God made the world in Genesis. And while human reason can conceptually grasp the objective world as it appears to us, uh, can conceptually reconstruct its laws of motion, and so on, uh, we do not make the world which we then know. And this is why Kant, in the context of the Enlightenment, gets really interesting. Because while it appears as if he is dethroning human reason here, uh, from the position attributed to it by the Enlightenment, by Kant's um, reading of the Enlightenment, he's in fact recrowning or rethroning. Uh, reason elsewhere, not in the realm of physics, uh, which deals with the laws of nature, but in ethics, which, do, which deals with the laws of man. So, he argues in the groundwork uh, of the Metaphysics of Morals, uh, which was published in 1787, so it's a few years after White's Enlightenment, that in the moral sphere, man exists both as a knowing, reasoning subject and as a thing in itself. So he's bound not by the laws of nature, but by the laws of practical reason. Laws authored, that is, by rational beings. Uh, so there is causality here, but it's the causality of freedom, because the force at work here is nothing but the will of rational beings itself, which, as he states, is autonomous. And why is this will autonomous? Why are we free to will ends we choose for ourselves? Because the power of reason, the power to will an end and action for myself, independent, as Kant puts it, of determination by alien causes. Or as he puts it elsewhere, the will is a law to itself. But we're in the realm of ethics here, uh, 
and this is not, you know, Kant's not proposing a recipe for a, a, a do as you please uh, morality, which isn't a morality at all. Uh, he, he's also asking what makes a good will. Um, and Kant argues that it's a rational being who wills himself to do his duty to the law, wills himself, that is, through his reason, uh, to his duty, to his duty, to do his duty to the law in spite of inclinations, desires, needs, etc. That if he wasn't rational, would simply determine another course of action. And you might say, why is that free? Um, obeying the law sounds like a restriction. But you have to remember that for Kant, we are the authors of these laws, and we author them according to what we, thanks to our reason, think we ought to do. Um, the absolutely good will, if you like, is a form of willing, a form of practical activity, a practical willingness to do what one knows one ought to do. Not what we want to do or what we need to do, but what we ought to do. And in that willingness to do what one ought to do, not what one would rather do, as Kant puts it, our sublimity, our human capacity to resist external natural determinations is writ large. Now, of course, Kant calls these orts imperatives, which exist because of, as he puts it, the imperfect constitution of the subject, that is, the crooked timber of humanity. And what makes these imperatives moral? Because they're universal. Uh, in the words of the categorical imperative, if the maxim according to which we are acting in a given situation is to be moral, it is because we are acting in such a way that I can also will that my maxim should become a universal law. So, in other words, when we are acting as morally autonomous beings, we are acting as universal beings. We are reasoning, if you like, from the perspective of the universal. And Kant's thought spirals upwards like this. You know, he eventually imagines a state in which every being treats every other rational being as an end in themselves. And he calls, and he calls, calls that the kingdom of ends. And this is almost like the, the moral universe realised. Now, I think Kant's conception of practical reason, moral autonomy, is the height of Enlightenment thought. Um, it's born through a critique of Enlightenment thought, um, but a critique in the name of Enlightenment. And I think after Kant, the historical, light, the historical Enlightenment starts to draw to a close. Um, of course, as Kant describes it, the Enlightenment continues, and it really does continue. It continues, I think, in the idealist <laughs> dialectics of Hegel and the materialist dialectics of Marx. But the mainstream of European thought and culture shrinks away after the French Revolution from the power of human reason uh, to explain why things are as they are, uh, to overcome challenges, to overcome obstacles. Um, so during the French Revolution, a, a kind of semi-feudal reaction starts to emerge. You know, you think of Edmund Burke's um, reflections on the French Revolution, where the past tradition is elevated to the point where it and not human reason should determine the future. And later still, especially after 1848, reason itself is effectively dehumanised, uh, seen as nothing more than instrumental reason. Uh, the will there is reduced, I think, to little more than nothingness, the will to nothingness, as Nietzsche would have it. But I'm moving too far ahead, I'm moving into tomorrow, in, I think into, uh, into tomorrow's lecture on the counter Enlightenment. So I think, in, I think the legacy of Enlightenment persists, but it persists, to misquote uh, Theodore Adorno, one of its 20th century critics, uh, because the moment to realise its promise was missed, but I don't think that promise has gone away, which is my rather weak ending to, to, to this piety in my life.